Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing from University Communications. A surgical team at Duke University Hospital has become the first in North America to implant a new generation artificial heart. The patient, Matthew Moore, a 39 year old from Shalote in southeastern North Carolina, was referred to Duke in June after a sudden and unexpected diagnosis of heart failure. Mr. Moore's surgery was the first in studies approved by the FDA to evaluate whether the artificial heart is a viable option as a life-saving step before transplant for patients with end-stage biventricular heart failure. We have a number of Duke physicians and the patient's spouse with us today to discuss the surgery. I'll make introductions as we go, and then we'll open it up to questions once everyone has had a chance to speak. First, we'll talk to the surgeons who performed this procedure. Dr. Carmelo Milano is a professor in the Department of Surgery at the Duke School of Medicine, where he's the Chief of Adult Cardiac Surgery. And Dr. Jacob Schroeder is an Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery and Surgical Director of the Heart Transplant Program. Dr. Milano, we'll start with you. Um, how is your patient doing and how does this artificial heart differ from other options already available to cardiac patients? Well, again, on, uh, on Monday, uh, we performed an implant of the CARMAT device which is a, a novel total artificial heart product, which has not been previously implanted in the U.S. Um, and to step back a moment, uh, there are about 2,000 patients uh, in the state who have end-stage heart failure uh, of a terminal nature. And despite our efforts with uh, heart transplantation and pumps with j which uh, just replaced the left ventricle, um, you know, many of these patients don't have a treatment option. So we're very happy to engage uh, with the CARMAT uh, company and with their product. Um, the patient we implanted, as you stated, is Mr. Moore. Uh, he suffered from advanced coronary artery disease and uh, a terminal heart condition. Um, and on Monday, we were able to implant him with the CARMAT device, which has a number of uh, novel features we believe that this device will have improved hemocompatibility um, and be safer uh, to support patients uh, as a bridge to transplant, but potentially also um, as a uh, destination uh, treatment. So uh, fortunately, our patient is doing well. And I think uh, Dr. Schroeder perhaps can provide more details about the procedure on, uh, that took place on Monday. Sure, absolutely. And I'd like to move on to Dr. Schroeder now, who I should know and correct myself is an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery. That's my bad. Um, but Dr. Schroeder, can you tell us um, about the surgery itself and, and how Mr. Moore is doing? Well, uh, absolutely. Thank you. First, I would like to say thank you to everyone at this institution. This is, represents a tremendous uh, amount of work across departments and divisions. And uh, I would be really remiss if I didn't thank Frank Benedetti, our clinical research coordinator, and Laura Blue, um, our head VAD coordinator, who really uh, were the foundation of all our efforts of everyone on this call and, and our efforts for the patient. So, um, you know, the surgery itself uh, is, is something that you'll rarely see. Uh, essentially, what you do is you actually remove both the left and right ventricles and then place the artificial heart um, in its place. Um, this uh, was a little bit challenging uh, because uh, Mr. Moore had had prior uh, surgery within the last month, um, but it went, went very well. Uh, I think the thing that has been most striking about um, the, the operation and uh, Mr. Moore's uh, progress is that he has been very stable throughout the whole process. And it really is a testament, I think, to uh, the device and the device sort of auto-regulates, uh, which is, is amazing. So we don't spend a lot of time adjusting things. It adjusts itself, which is, is a, really a new feature of this device over any other device we could use, either the other FDA approved device, or if we fashioned a total artificial heart ourselves out of two uh, uh, LVADs. Sure, absolutely. It certainly does seem to be an incredible in innovation. Uh, we have a number of questions about the device itself, but we're going to come back to that. For right now, I would like to move on to Matthew Moore's wife, Rachel, who is a nurse, and she is also with us today. Ms. Moore, thank you for being here. And when your husband arrived at Duke, you were expecting he would undergo heart bypass surgery. Um, what made you, you know, um, willing, what factors went into your decision uh, to be the first in, in the U.S. to receive this particular kind of device? Um. 
First of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, and thank you to the surgeons who have performed this um, between them and, and, and God. It is an absolute miracle that Matthew's still with us today. Um, you know, the decision was actually very easy. <laughs> um, you know, since we found out that he had this um, heart, these heart issues, it was about the second week of June. Um, every single decision and um, step that has been put forth, you know, before us, it has been, there's no other explanation than our faith in our in God. And every step that has happened since then has been, there's only, the only explanation is because of God. And we are very thankful for that. Um, you know, that was obviously the first decision, you know, he got us this far. So there's obviously something that Matthew Moore is supposed to do. So um, that was, that was easy. The second thing is my background. Um, I spent 10 years as a post-op cardiothoracic nurse in Charlotte. Um, and so, you know, I turned the wife off and turned the nurse on and was fascinated. Every single, you know, detail about this, you know, I knew just enough to barely understand. Um, but, you know, just being fortunate enough to be part of, you know, advancements in technology and, you know, cardiac surgery, amazing. And, you know, given the opportunity of that, I mean, there has to be a first at some point. Um, and the options of this and what it, and the, the car mat and what it provides and, you know, how it will allow him to heal until we, you know, move on to a real transplant. You know, it just, it just seemed like a natural thing. So, you know, those two factors with, with, um, you know, also that these doctors here at Duke um, and the entire, Higher staff. If anybody was going to be able to perform this, it would be here at Duke. So I have absolutely nothing but wonderful things to say about Dr. Schroeder, um, Dr. Milano, and um, the entire staff that has been here at Duke um, this far. So, you know, between, you know, our faith, understanding that there is obviously something that my husband is here to do um, and that he has not done yet. Um, the technology and knowing exactly what's going on. And then the staff here, it was an easy decision. You know, Dr. Schroeder came in and told me about it. And I, I pretty much told him yes before he left that day. So um, I just I just felt like this was what we, we needed to do. And, you know, what we needed to do to keep Matthew here for me as my husband and also for our three-year-old son. So. Um, that's pretty much was a very easy decision. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. um, the anesthesiologist for this surgery was Dr. Sharon McCartney, who's an assistant professor in Duke's Department of Anesthesiology and an ICU doctor. Uh, Dr. McCartney, can you tell us a little bit about what particular anesthetic challenges this procedure posed to you? Absolutely. Oftentimes our patients with heart failure can be um, the most challenging to take care of under anesthesia. Um, inducing and maintaining anesthesia um, can lead to uh, low blood pressure or hypotension, and patients with failing hearts can have even more profound low blood pressure. Oftentimes, we'll need to start inotropic vasoactive medications to increase the blood pressure um, uh, prior to going on the, the heart-lung machine uh, that bypasses the blood um, from the heart and the lungs so that the device can be implanted. After the device is implanted, um, the device will replace the role of all, all of the prior heart function. And so we'll rely much less on those medications to increase the blood pressure. But instead at this point, we'll manage any bleeding from the open heart surgery, the major open heart surgery that they just had um, and ensure the pump um, has adequate blood flow um, so that the device can um, continue to pump and provide blood flow to the rest of the body. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we're gonna be taking questions shortly, but first we want to put this in uh, some sort of context. So we're gonna go on to Dr. Edward Chen, who is with us. He is chief of the Division of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at Duke. Uh, Dr. Chen, what does it mean for Duke to be involved in this kind of pioneering surgery? Can you put this in some context for us? Sure, thanks very much, Greg. Since its inception over 30 years ago, the Duke Heart Transplant Program has become virtually unrivaled across the globe both in terms of the number of patients transplanted here at Duke, 
as well as the quality of care provided by the entire team. This program embodies the concepts of providing outstanding quality, innovative, as well as innovative patient care at the highest level which exists in cardiac transplantation. Members of the team fully embrace a collegial professional collaboration in a multidisciplinary manner, all aimed at providing the best care possible for our patients. The successful implant of the CARMAT artificial heart in Mr. Moore is an example of this collaboration and represents the latest in a long list of accomplishments by the Duke Heart Transplant team, all aimed at further improving and expanding the treatment options available for patients with end-stage cardiac disease. I could not be prouder of the Duke Heart Transplant Program and its individual team members at here at Duke. Thank you. Absolutely, Dr. Chen, thank you for sharing that. We also have with us Dr. Manesh Patel, and he is Chief of the Division of Cardiology. Dr. Patel, what does this advance must tell us about the future of heart failure care, both at Duke and beyond? Well, thanks. And I guess I'll just start again by thanking Ms. Moore for being here. You know, a lot of this is about the patients. And, and as Dr. Chen just shared, you know, everything we do is to hopefully meet people where they are. And um, it's, thank you so much for being in the press conference. This is scary stuff. So we appreciate you joining us. Um, I would say that, you know, I, I do believe there's more for Mr. Moore to do. And thanks for choosing us to help deliver his care. Heart failure, as we know, is that is happening to millions of Americans every year. And it's a condition where the heart doesn't squeeze as, as well as it should. And we've actually had dramatic improvements in medications, even electrical synchronization of the heart to make it better. But when it eventually fails to work, cannot pump enough blood to the organs, we have to look towards things like transplantation. As you just heard from Dr. Chen, this team of stars led by Dr. Milano, Dr. Schroeder and others, including our, our cardiologists, Dr. Stavore, Dr. Chet Patel, and Dr. Katz and Russell, who help with the mechanical circulatory support system, all work together with our anesthesiology colleagues and our team to figure out what's the best choice. What's really intriguing about CARMAT, in my mind, is they've made two significant leaps. The first is the biocompatibility, so that there is potentially less need for anticoagulation, and that's a leap that has not yet been made. The second is the interplay. You know, at least prior to this, we've been thinking a lot about uh, we haven't been thinking as much about volume as much as versatility or figuring about flow. And so the second leap to me is the interplay and the way the device is probably interacting to think about flow in the left and the right side of the heart. That to me mean, means that there'll likely be further innovations in size and other places we might do things to support the cardiovascular system. But again, coming back to Mr. Moore and the opportunities to say that, you know, there are many millions of Americans that are obviously affected by heart failure. And these types of advances hopefully just continue to raise the opportunity for us to work as a team to improve their outcomes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. And thanks to all of our panelists for those uh, opening remarks. We are going to open it up to questions now. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We're going to start with those. But you can also pose questions via the Q&A window at any time, and we will work our way through those. Thanks also to everybody watching this on YouTube. Please like and subscribe so you can be notified of future Duke Media Briefings. Okay, we have a number of questions uh, that relate to the device itself. Um, and so, Dr. Milano, I'll start with you. And if, if other people need to can jump in or if there are other people you want to offer the question to, you can certainly do that. Um, so one of the first questions is, uh, what kind of patient is currently a good candidate for this kind of device? Are there particular kind of constraints? Well, the, the device is meant to help patients that have end stage or severe failure of both the right side of the heart or the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And uh, there's a fair number of patients like this. Um, Mr. Moore was also afflicted by uh, difficult heart rhythms that made both sides ineffective. So uh, refractory ventricular tachycardia is that rhythm. And that's another type of patient that would be well supported by this uh, device. In its current state, however, the device is, uh, is large and there are size constraints. So. Um, one, of the, one of the parts of the planning for this was to make certain that the device would fit uh, Mr. Moore. And so there were a number of uh, measurements and review of those measurements that took place to make certain that the, uh, that the device would fit inside Mr. Moore. And fortunately, um, you know, it was a good fit and uh, he was of adequate size to accommodate the device. But uh, really, the most common patient I see that we're going to apply this device for will be patients with severe 
failure of both sides of the heart, uh, but then larger patients who can accommodate the device. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, and a follow-up question to that, and I'm not sure if, you know, uh, if us here on the Duke team have put to uh, best place to answer this, but there's some natural curiosity about the likelihood that a smaller device could be developed that could uh, that smaller patients might be able to use that could serve the same function or is do we do we know that the the size of the device is just kind of part and parcel of the the care that it needs to deliver do we understand that yet well the the um the approval process you know the fda approval process is quite complicated um and i think uh the first step is to uh you know, prove the safety of the device as it currently exists. But I, I see no reason why, uh, if the technology is successful and safe, why it could not be uh, downsized to accommodate some smaller patients. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question that we've got, Dr. Chen, maybe you or Dr. Patel would be best place to, to answer this. I'll, I'll let you guys hash that out. But um, people are wondering how having an implant like this would affect somebody's prioritization for a, a heart transplant, since right now this is seen as a bridge rather than a permanent replacement, if I understand correctly. Greg, I think that that question would be best answered by Dr. Schroeder or Milano there. You know, they understand prioritization of, of potential recipients. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, is that something you could speak to? Absolutely. So, um, you know, the way uh, organs are allocated are by a status. Uh, and so Mr. Moore currently, if we listed him, would be status two, which is the second highest status. And frankly, I think we could argue that he should be status one, um, because although this is technically a dischargeable total artificial heart, Mr. Moore could go home at some point. No one in the United States uh, has ever been discharged with this device. Uh, so I think that we would be granted an exception for status one, um, which is great because when Mr. Moore is ready to be transplanted, that means that he will likely or hopefully be transplanted within a week or so. Um, and so I think uh, that's that's very important. And that's one of the things that, that we also liked about the device. There was another question that uh, asked if this was, you know, a permanent uh, replacement for him. So no, in this trial, this is only as a bridge to transplantation. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's the, that's our focus now is that this is a bridge for uh, Mr. Moore to get better and rehabilitate from everything that he's been through, which has been significant. And then when he is, when he's street legal, we're going to transplant him. Absolutely. Thank you. And I guess uh, an associated question that we'd had in advance, we talked about this, as you said, as a bridge to transplant. And I guess people are curious about how long that bridge can be. Now, of course, this is the first of its kind, so it's hard to say, but is there an expectation for how long this device could last as a patient is awaiting um, a full transplant? I think that we don't really have that data, but honestly, people, I mean, we expect that people could live for years with this device, theoretically. I mean, our goal is, of course, to transplant Mr. Moore as soon as he's ready. So I'm hoping that in, you know, three, four months, maybe even less, that we'll be ready to transplant him, though. Sure, absolutely. And, and while we're with you, uh, Dr. Schroeder, we had another question about the total duration of the surgery, how long it lasted, the main phases and the sensitive step, which I'm assuming you know exactly what that means. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about how long the whole process took and break it down. Uh, I don't know what the sensitive step is. They're all sensitive uh, in this kind of operation. It was a very long operation. We, um, we, we had a, a very thorough briefing with all the team members, including members from the CARMAT uh, team, uh, four of which came over for the implant. Um, and we started at maybe around 8 and finished around 4 p.m., um, which I think for even normal a long cardiac surgery, that's long. You know, there are a bunch of, of different steps. You, know, you have to re-enter the, the chest uh, safely, and he'd had prior surgery, and then um, cannulate and go on the heart-lung machine. And then Dr. Milano and I remove the ventricles, um, and you attach uh, essentially cuffs onto the, the atria, the top chambers. Uh, and um, then uh, you have to attach the device. The, the most difficult part of this was actually getting the device uh, in the chest. The device at this point, at this stage is large. And unfortunately that may limit uh, this first generation's applicability. Uh, we won't be able to use it in smaller patients. 
and then attach the device, uh, the outflow from the device to the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Um, both the, the pulmonary artery was also, I guess, a sensitive area. But again, beyond that, um, you know, none of the steps are critically hard, just a lot of them. And, and it's, you know, it's very sort of painstaking. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Milano, I'd like to come back to you. We had a, a question about how many surgeons participated. Was it yourself and Dr. Schroeder were the two surgeons or were there other people involved also in the surgery itself? Um, no, I and Dr. Schroeder were the primary surgeons. Dr. Chen was also uh, available in the room, but uh, it was really the, the three of us in the room. Sure, absolutely. Another question we've had asks about how the technical difficulty of this uh, implanting this device compared with, with a full transplant. Was it comparable or a very different process? Uh, I would say it's a very different process. Um, you know, in a heart transplant, the old heart, uh, you just remove. Um, you know, technically a, a, a heart transplant, uh, an uncomplicated heart transplant is actually technically one of the easier operations we do. This, uh, you have to leave half the heart, the top chambers, uh, and attach things to it that, uh, you know, in, in such a manner that there's no bleeding, et cetera. And so again, the, 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 all the steps are painstaking um, and, you know, critical. Sure, absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier Frank Benedetti, other members of the team that were involved in this, and we've had a question asked how, how long the training was prior to implant. Can you talk a little bit about how you prepared for this, given that it was something that nobody had ever done before in the US or at Duke? Well, you know, again, I think it just speaks to how we do things at Duke. Um, you know, within a matter of really about three weeks, we had our training in, in Pittsburgh uh, with many of the members here, uh, and then the the CARMAT team came to Duke and we trained over 150 people. I think they were a little surprised because we, you know, they think they were, we were going to train a small team, but we have a very large team. We have 280 nurses in our cardiac surgery ICU and we trained a number of them, uh, perfusionists, anesthesiologists, nurses, et cetera. And that took uh, about a week's time and then we were ready to go. Gotcha. Fantastic. Dr. Milano, coming back to you for a moment, uh, Dr. Patel mentioned earlier about the biological tissue involved in this device. Uh, what is significant about that and why is it significant that it has sensors inside that can regulate it? Uh, no, I think this is a very important point that Dr. Patel brought up. The, the lining inside of this device uh, is a, a bovine uh, pericardial uh, tissue that has been preserved. And we're familiar with this tissue because it's utilized in heart valves and has been very successful as a material utilized uh, in heart valves. Uh, also in experimental animal implants, this, uh, this surface shows uh, signs that it becomes uh, covered by the patient's own uh, vascular lining. So the patient's own cells can overgrow uh, the, uh, the bovine pericardium. So, the point of all that is, is that it is very compatible with, it becomes very compatible with blood elements and that should avoid uh, the development of clots and subsequent, uh, you know, adverse events like stroke from clots traveling off the device. So the device surface is a very, very important part of the uh, technology and we, we believe and we hope that we can prove that it is very blood uh, compatible. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and a follow-up question, you know, for those of us who are, uh, are not familiar with the device of heart surgery in general, we had a question asked whether the, the battery or the power for this is it completely internal or are there leads that are wired through the skin or how does that part of the powering part of it work? The, um, the, the device consumes a great deal of electrical power and we are unable at this time with the current technology to implant that power. So there is a a small power cord that, that comes out of Mr. Moore's side on the right side, and the, the, that cord attaches to batteries that are external. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, another question for the surgeons that is uh, something that I'm just going to convey to you because I can't interpret it at all, and it asks, what is the post-operative hemodynamic management strategy for a patient with this device? I, that's a great question. Um, you know, about 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Milano famously said that pulsatility is overrated uh, because the, the, the newest generation of LVAD, uh, left ventricular assist devices are non-pulsatile, they're continuous flow. 
And I think we've realized it's the only time Dr. Milano has ever been wrong about anything, one, but two, uh, that a pulse is good. And it's good in many senses that your organs like pulsatile blood flow, but it is much easier to take care of a patient who has a pulse. And I think our entire team from the bedside nurses to the uh, anesthetists and uh, intensivists, uh, you look at his monitor and he has normal hemodynamics. His blood pressure is normal. And additionally, the monitor for the device actually shows you the pressure on the left and the right sides. And so really it is almost like um, uh, you know, taking care of a normal patient. And that's what we've sort of found that has been very relatively uncomplicated. A lot of our, our changes have, have really only had to do with fluid management uh, and then the management of the blood pressure. Sure, thank you. Uh, and I think that we can all agree that probably not only is it better to care for a patient with a pulse, it's better to be a patient with a pulse uh, also. Uh, we have another technical question here um, that we'll stay with you for, Dr. Schroeder, um, that asks, how is pulmonary hypertension managed intra-op through post-op? Is there a need for inhaled pulmonary vasodilators? And I hope I said that correctly. That's a gr that is also a great question. So, um, you know, I think if we need to manage uh, long-term uh, pulmonary hypertension, we could. Uh, the, the reason, one of the reasons why this should be better for the patient is that with the absence of left-sided heart failure, uh, hopefully pulmonary hypertension is reversible and should be reversed with the device alone. But we can use uh, inhaled medications or intravenous medications also to help manage uh, pulmonary hypertension. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. Sharon, uh -huh. do, Sharon do you have anything to say about that? What do you think? All I was gonna add is um, as opposed to patients with like ventricular assist devices um, who, we, who we almost always use uh, inhaled pulmonary vasodilators empirically because the right heart has to adjust to the new LVAD that's implanted um, and uh, any decrease in pulmonary hypertension to promote that forward flow um, is very beneficial to the patient. Whereas in Mr. Moore with the CARMAT because the right ventricle is now completely replaced, we don't, um, uh, we're, we're not we're not as worried about um, the the pulmonary artery. He um, he had left sided heart disease that was causing any increase in PA pressures, pulmonary artery pressures, um, and since that's been reversed and the RV um, the right ventricle is now completely replaced, um, the blood is going to pump easily from the right side to the left. Um, in some of the patients in Europe, they did um, put on uh, uh, pulmonary vasodilators if the patient. Um, continued to have uh, increased pulmonary hypertension after the implant, but we didn't see that with Mr. Moore. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you both. And Dr. McCartney, you mentioned obviously that this procedure has been done in Europe. And right now, of course, this took place at Duke as part of a, a study uh, authorized by the FDA. We've had a number of questions related to what the kind of time frame uh, is that we could expect to see this device being more widely used. I'm not sure if there's anybody on the panel that can speak to what the typical time frame is. Of course, it will depend on the outcomes for patients that have the device implanted. Um, but can anybody kind of speak to the general time frame that maybe the public could be uh, expecting if things go well, that we might see this device more widely implemented? Well, we we are engaged in a clinical trial, and so Mr. Moore is the first patient in that trial. So we're prepared to enroll additional patients, and, and there is FDA approval for additional patients to be enrolled as part of the clinical trial. In terms of the, the timing for how long this, uh, this may take before it's FDA approved, that's a very difficult question uh, to answer. But we do have the ongoing ability as part of our clinical trial to treat other patients with this device. And we're, you know, we're um, very much uh, looking forward to trying to help other patients with this technology. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ms. Moore, I'd like to, to come back to you. Obviously, you know, this has been um, a whirlwind for you and your family over the last month or so. Um, have you, you know, is it premature to say, have you talked about like plans for the future? Have you thought about kind of the first things that you want to do, um, you know, once uh, you and your husband are able to kind of go back to what we might call normal life? Honestly, I have not given that a whole lot of, of thought. Um, the past month has been day by day, minute by minute at times. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of, of hope for things we're able to do in the future. Um, of course, a lot of that is centered around our little boy. Um, 
And I know one thing that we will um, potentially try to get back to is we are foster parents. And so, um, you know, once he's able, we're going to open that back up because we are firm believers in um, what being foster care foster parents means and, um, you know, what it means to each individual child. So um, that will be one thing that we start back um, as soon as he is able. Um, but bes besides that, I'm sure Disney World will be in the plans at some point <laughs> um, because uh, everyone's um, upset to know that I've never been. So I would love to take Marshall to Disney World at some point, but that's really the only other thought that I've had right now, except for to get Matthew home um, and let us at least start having some sort of normalcy back to our life. Sure, absolutely. And there is certainly no more American way to celebrate than going to Disney World. And I also applaud you for being foster parents. North Carolina is always in need of quality parents to be going through the foster care system and I would encourage anybody who is able to do so to check it out we've got some more technical questions here so I'm going to pivot back to our um our surgeons um and Dr Schroeder we've had a question uh, about the mention of auto regulation and it asks how responsive is the TAH to physical activity or circadian rhythm it is actually quite responsive um and you know basically the the pump is is able to sense the amount of filling uh and increase its rate uh, and that's critical for somebody who uh is either doing less it may slow down but may do more you know the the folks at CarMat have this great video of a guy riding his bicycle down the street uh with this car map. And so, you know, this is a huge change compared to say even our, you know, the state of the art LVADs, which are tremendous technology, but they run at one speed essentially. And they do not uh, offer that ability to increase circulation uh, with, with demand. Sure, absolutely. And, and staying with, uh, with you, Dr. Schroeder, but getting a bit less technical now, we've got a number of questions coming in about the patient himself, how he's doing, um, whether you, know, you guys have been able to communicate with him and, and how he's doing now three days post-op versus where your expectations and hopes were. He is doing quite well. He's very, very stable. Again, I think that's the key. Um, sure. We have been able to communicate with him. Um, and he, you know, the goal is obviously to get him up and start moving around soon. Uh, he's going to have significant rehabilitation. I mean, he's, you know, he had essentially cardiac arrest uh, on one of our step down units here out of the blue uh, and then was placed on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, and so he's been in bed for essentially a month. Um, and so we have, he has a lot of work to do with us. Uh, but I think he can do it. But he's doing great. Sure, thank you. And, and Miss Moore, coming back to that, Dr. Schroeder said that you know you guys have been able to communicate with him to some extent. What have you been able to communicate to him so far, other than just you you love him and you, you're glad he's still with you, obviously. Well, we uh, came in this morning and he had um, been extubated and was sitting there with just a nasal cannula in um, with a little bit of oxygen, and I was absolutely floored at that point. Um, he looked at me like, where have you been? <laughs> um, and we I just basically told him, you know, that um, he has been through so much. And I asked him if he knew who I was. And he said, yes, you're Rachel. And I was like, yes. Um, and then his mom asked if he knew who she was. And he said, no. And she said, yes, you do. And he said, that's my mama. <laughs> so he, um, he is very... Um, you know, I have all ideas that he will have a lot to say to us um, in the coming days. Um, and he probably won't believe a lot that we have to say to him. But um, the time that I have had to, with him this morning, I just honestly didn't do anything but just stare at him. Um, just because it's just a miracle he's with us. Um, and I am just, I'm, I'm so grateful. And so I haven't, I haven't had too many conversations with him yet, but um, that will be to come this afternoon. So. Sure, of course. And we can only imagine the, the relief that you must feel and how delighted you must be that he's come through this so well. Um, coming back to um, our surgeons, there was, uh, Dr. Milana, you mentioned earlier, you know, how many uh, patients deal with heart failure in the US. Um, we've had a question if you are wondering how many potential patients in a given year in the US could actually be in need of a device like this given that we're talking about the biventricular heart failure that's uh, the more extreme end of the spectrum? Well, um, 
that's a complicated question, but you know, we think of heart transplantation, we've mentioned heart transplantation several times, uh, and we're one of the most active heart transplant centers, um, you know, in, in the world really. But um, in the United States, there's probably 100,000 patients with terminal heart failure, and there's only about 3,000 or 4,000 heart transplants per year. So as wonderful as heart transplantation is, um, you know, we're only getting three or 4,000 patients out of the 100,000 patients who have this uh, terrible uh, terminal condition. So there is a huge opportunity for additional therapies for this, this group of patients. And we hope that uh, the CARMAT uh, is one of the, um, you know, one of the potential therapies that can help the, the other, uh, you know, 96,000 uh, patients out there. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I think we have worked our way through most of the questions, so I think we can go ahead and safely wrap it up here. Uh, I think we have been very clear on how grateful Miss Moore is to everybody at Duke. This is certainly um, a pioneering surgery, a remarkable thing, and I appreciate everybody joining us here to discuss it. Um, for those reporters on the call, we will be following up with a recording of this um, of this event uh, and a transcript too for you to use in your broadcast. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your perspectives. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming Duke media briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu or if you're watching on YouTube, just like and subscribe. In the meantime, please practice heart healthy habits. Thanks and have a great day.